are committed to getting them up on our website. And our website has a ridiculously long name. It was uh, written by our committee. That was the problem. Uh, stop frack gas damage ny.org. Ridiculous, but there it is. And it's on all of, I believe, the registration information you've gotten. So it should be uh, accessible to you. We may uh, figure out how to simplify sometime later, but right now that's where it's at. And we will be posting the speaker slides. We will be posting uh, a link to the video of these um, today's events. And on it, there are some resource materials. And we anticipate a lot of growth in the resource materials, especially if we are successful in working together to figure out what needs to be there to be supportive of each other. So. Um, that's going to happen. I am thrilled and delighted. I now have quite a sheaf of salmon-colored sheets. And um, we'll be looking at them so that we can make our final half hour most effective. If everybody would please sit down and not be talking in here. Yo! Yo! Thank you very much. OK. Um, we are having, a, to me, one of the, uh, all of these sessions are very exciting, and this one on air and compressors is uh, among those. Um, the first speaker is going to be our favorite, Bill Paduka, who's going to give us, again, a little bit of who regulates what. Okay, so... Um, air uh, and air resources are a little bit different than some of the things we've talked about. Um, so strictly, you know, EPA and through the Clean Air Act is regulating air quality, but that authority has been delegated in general down to the states to actually uh, implement through these state implementation plans. And so in particular in New York State, definitely our implement implementation plans have been good enough that, that the New York DEC is the one who strictly is um, carrying the day-to-day -day regulation of the air. And that is done through various air permits. So any stationary source that is potentially emitting enough pollutants requires an air permit. There are three levels in New York State. At the lowest level, which are sort of these small sources thought not to be of great concern, basically they register with the DEC. That's a very low level event that does not require any kind of public notice. So it is not published on the environmental notice board. The two higher level sort, uh, permits then are what's called uh, the state facility permit, which may or may not get a notice on the environmental notice board, depending a bit, usually whether it runs into some, some caps or other things. But the largest sources require a Title V facility permit in, in sort of you know, jargon of, of the trade. Uh, those definitely get noticed on, on the environmental notice board. One other difference about air um, has to do with what happens because there's some EPA oversight. So as we talked about before, a draft permit comes in, and there's some time period then before a final permit is issued, and that's a comment period. Again, any time a draft permit is out there, the public is allowed to comment on that, and for certain cases there might be you know, a public hearing or something else. But in this particular case, even once the final permit is issued, the EPA gets a 45-day review period uh, before the final permit is actually issued. And that is because the authority to regulate the air is actually vested in the federal government and just has been delegated to the state to carry out. So we're talking about air in this session because we're all talking about compressor stations, um, which are, are a significant source of pollutants. We didn't talk about it in the pipeline session because until the EPA wakes up and starts to seriously consider the um, global warming implications of fugitive methane leaks, pipelines are not considered in EPA pounds to be a major you know, pollution issue that needs to be regulated. Compressor stations, everyone pretty much recognizes are, and therefore have various authorities over them. So um, again, this goes back to kind of pipelines. If it's a FERC regulated pipeline, if it's an interstate pipeline or a, a thing that simply connects to interstate pipelines, the compressor station is regulated by FERC. And if it's a state, an interstate line, it's going to be regulated by the PSC. But in any case, it requires a DEC air permit to operate. I think that may be, yeah, all I had to say. Uh, 
I am uh, very delighted that uh, Dan Rachel, is that how I pronounce it? Rachel, uh, who's a project attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council in their New York program. He's a lead attorney with NRDC's Community Fracking Defense Project, providing legal assistance to local governments community groups and individuals that are or may be harmed by the impacts of fracking or its associated infrastructure. And early on, well, early on, a couple of months ago, uh, the planning group said, boy, we've got a lot of legal questions here. And I sort of put them out to a bunch of lawyers who I thought might be willing to, uh, for free, give us some information. And I have to tell you, Dan has been the most uh, dedicated, and here he is today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so as, as Ellen said, I'm, I'm, my name is Dan Rochelle. I'm a staff attorney with NRDC, and I work with our Community Fracking Defense Project, which does a bunch of different things, mainly building upon the great work that Helen and David did um, in New York with uh, sort of the local. Are you asking either you hold it in your Hold hand it. Hand Here, let's, let's hold it. Let's hold it. I'm building on a lot of great works that the Slotchies did in terms of counseling municipalities on ordinances that ban or limit fracking. We also do advocacy work on behalf of greater municipal control over fracking and other industrial harms, and also in, we involve ourselves in litigation um, with respect to those issues. So I'm going to have one, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the legal authority of New York municipalities to protect local air quality. And um, I will just note that this is the first time I'm presenting this material, and my computer broke this morning, so I didn't have a chance to practice it. So if it's a little rough and bumpy, bear with me. Um, so what am I going to talk about today? So I'm talking about this ability of municipalities to pass local air quality ordinances. And these are going to be ordinances of general applicability to all sorts of uh, polluting sources within the town. But the question is, because this is a conference about uh, fracking and fracking infrastructure, how would those air ordinances apply to fracking infrastructure? Could they apply to fracking infrastructure? Um, and the question, and the answer is, you know, somewhat unclear and a little bit complicated, but I'll try and walk you through. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about preemption, which some of you may be familiar with from the Dryden and Middlefield cases, just sort of a general overview. Um, I'm going to talk about how that applies in the municipal context in New York with respect to federal law and then also to state law. And then I'm going to try and put it all together into one um, I don't know what the right metaphor is, casserole or, or some, sort of, <laughs> some sort of mixture. Um, so where does, where does preemption come from? Well, on the federal side, preemption comes from the Constitution, which says that federal law in the area where um, you know, the, the federal authorities are able to legislate and regulate shall be the supreme law of the land. That means that where there is a conflict between valid federal law and valid state law, federal law will win. Federal law will supersede or preempt. And there is a similar, there's similar preemption between state law and local laws, although that doesn't come from the federal constitution, it comes from the New York constitution and other um, state statutes. Um, so there are a bunch of different flavors of preemption. The first is explicit. So that's where a state or federal law explicitly says we are overriding uh, state law or we are overriding local law. We hereby do this. And the most famous example probably to this group is from the New York oil, gas, and solution mining law. This is the preemption provision that was at issue in the Dryden Middlefield cases. Uh, this is a state law regulating oil and gas that said it shall supersede all laws and ordinances relating to the regulation of the oil, gas, and solution mining industries. And as we all probably know, that does not include zoning. Um, the next type of preemption is conflict preemption. And this is a little bit trickier. This is where a statute does not say, where a law does not say explicitly that it is going to preempt local law, but there would be, or, or state law, but that there would be a direct conflict with local or state law. So the example um, that I've heard that I really like, what if, the, what if there's a federal law that says uh, children have to play baseball after school, and there's a state law that says children have to do their homework before dinner time? Is there a conflict there? 
Um, it, it gets it gets a little murky. Perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't. It depends on the circumstances, and it depends on whether um, there is a conflict, whether following both, well, whether following the state or local law would conflict with the accomplishment of the full purpose and objectives of the overriding law of the federal law or the state law. Um, and then there's field preemption, which gets a little tricky. Um, this is where a legislature has so comprehensively regulated in a particular area that there's just obviously no space at all for the inferior sovereign, either the state or the locality, to do any regulation. They've just preempted the whole field. Um, so those are the three main types of preemption. It differs from state to state. This is mainly from federal law, but these principles um, apply pretty much um, you know, across the 50 states in one form or another. Um, so when we're talking about preemption with respect to oil and gas infrastructure or preemption of air ordinances governing oil and gas infrastructure, you have to know what you're talking about. And I'll go through this quickly because I think most people in this crowd are familiar with all of these different types of infrastructures uh, or different types of um, uh, facilities. There's pipelines, obviously, uh, which can be interstate or intrastate. And as uh, uh, Bill pointed out earlier, that makes a difference in terms of who's regulating uh, the facility. Uh, there's compressor stations, other infrastructure like pigging stations, uh, dehydrating and processing facilities. A pigging station is a station where they put in this device called a pig, which cleans the pipeline. Uh, they can be quite noisy. Um, and then, of course, uh, frack wells themselves and all of the uh, pertinent facilities, so waste ponds um, and um, condensate tanks, etc. So, oh, here we go, wells, waste pits. So I'm going to go through the different types of preemption that may, um, that a local ordinance may run up against, and I'll start with federal law. Um, the first federal law that might be relevant is the Pipeline Safety Act, um, and the question is, what does the Pipe Pipeline Safety Act regulate? It regulates all pipelines, both interstate and intrastate, and sets safety standards, and um, the Federal Department of Transportation is authorized to enforce this law. And the preemption provision in the Pipeline Safety Act is that states and it basically does not allow states or municipalities to adopt safety standards for interstate pipelines, and it doesn't allow them to adopt safety standards for intrastate pipelines that are incompatible with federal standards, that are less stringent than federal standards. Um, this is likely of limited applicability to municipal air ordinances. Um, because the courts, at least so far, or at least the Fifth Circuit, have interpreted this preemption provision, even with respect to interstate pipelines, relatively narrowly. The law, to be preempted, it has to have as its purpose the regulation of pipeline safety, and it has to have a direct and substantial effect on pipeline safety. So, so this is something to consider, but probably not a major preemption ob obstacle to a local law. The next federal law to consider, which is maybe more of an obstacle, is the Natural Gas Act. And this is where FERC gets their authority. Oh, so I'm sorry, I should go with applicability first. The Natural Gas Act only applies to interstate facilities, so not pipelines or appurtenant facilities within a state. Um, there, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is in charge, also known as FERC, um, and the preemption affects the transportation of sa or sale of natural gas in interstate commerce, and this has been interpreted as sort of preempting the field with respect to these interstate facilities. So the preemption here is pretty robust with respect to any facility that's regulated by FERC. So that's a pipeline, compressor station, storage facility, anything. However, the Natural Gas Act also has a savings clause. And what a savings clause is, it's, it's a provision of law that specifically exempts certain rights from any sort of preemption that would occur under the act. Any, and says explicitly there is no conflict. It's sort of the, the, the mirror image or the opposite of 
an explicit preemption clause. It's called a savings clause. So the Clean Air Act says that nothing in, or, or sorry, the Natural Gas Act says that nothing in the act should affect the rights of states under the Clean Air Act. Now this is where things, and this is the most complicated part of my pr uh, presentation today, this is where things get very tricky. So as Bill pointed out earlier, the, the authority to regulate under the Clean Air Act is shared by both EPA and state agencies. It's a system called cooperative federalism. So you have federal standards under the Clean Air Act, and then states, if they want to, can implement those standards through the creation of a state implementation program. And when they, they make this program, when they, they promulgate this program, it can, it can be um, certified by the federal government, and then that state program becomes federal law. So arguably, and the Clean Air Act gets much more complicated than that. I'm very much oversimplifying it, and I'm not an expert on the Clean Air Act and every specific provision of it. But in general, states have the ability to create these state implementation programs with respect to certain air pollutants and then create federal law. So the question is, what does this savings clause affect? Does it affect the rights that states have to make federal law under the Clean Air Act? Does it save those rights? Or does it save a more, a broader category of rights that states have just in general to pass air ordinances? Not the rights granted by the Clean Air Act, but the rights preserved by the Clean Air Act. And that's where things get very tricky. Um, because I'm running out of time, I won't talk about the Dominion transition, transmission case. Um, it, was a, it was a case that um, arguably did not address this particular question, but the holding implies that it would be just granted rights rather than preserved rights. Uh, the Clean Air Act, I'll go through quickly because again, I'm running out of time. Um, but the Clean Air Act is just replete with savings clauses that allow uh, states to adopt more stringent standards above federal standards and presumably also allows localities who are empowered through state law to adopt more stringent standards as well. And as I noted, uh, there's sort of dual authority for the, the Clean Air Act implementation. Um, the next, I'll go through some state statutes. Uh, the Air Pollution Control Act, which is the state version of the Clean Air Act. And here, again, this applies to all oil and gas infrastructure that would qualify for a permit, uh, some sort of air control permit based upon its potential to admit. Um, dual authority here again, and again, a bunch of savings clauses for local ordinances, so likely not a strong obstacle to municipal air ordinances. Um, where it gets a little bit more tricky and where there is probably clear preemption is the public service law. So the public service law applies to intrastate facilities, non-FERC regulated facilities that, uh, or major facilities, so that are facilities that are pipelines that are 1,000 feet or longer with pressures of in excess 125 pounds per square inch, um, regulated by the Public Service Commission, and the preemption provision is pretty broad here. It's municipal approvals, permits, or conditions on the construction or operation of a major facility, which would likely include compressor stations. So once a certificate has been granted for an intrastate facility, it's likely that there is a, a strong obstacle. This, this presents a strong obstacle to a municipal ordinance that would want to impose any sort of conditions on the operation of that facility. However, um, there is a duty of the PSC to consider local law, and it looks like the underscore didn't get all the way across. Um, the location of a facility must conform to applicable state and local laws or regulations, and it is binding on the commission to consider these local laws, except where the local laws are unreasonably restrictive. <laughs> and of course, that's within the discretion of the PSC to consider what is unreasonably restrictive. But the, the, the bottom line is that municipalities, if they have these laws on the books, this is something that it has to be considered by the PSC and is binding on the PSC and needs to be incorporated into the certificate um, to the extent that it deals with location and is not unreasonably restrictive. 
Um, so I'm sort of flying through this, but uh, another act, state act to consider is the oil, gas, and solution mining law of Dryden and Middlefield fame. Um, the applicability is to oil, gas, and solution mining industries. The question is whether um, a local air ordinance that applies only, that, that is, or, or attempted to be enforced against um, uh, compressor stations or pipeline facilities, whether that would fall in the ambit of the oil, gas, and solution mining law. It's a little bit unclear. It seems to me that this law is directed at extraction um, and uh, restoration of well sites versus transmission, uh, but it's, it's sort of an open question. Um, but as the Dryden and Middlefield opinions point out, if localities are regulating a different subject matter other than the oil, gas, and solution mining industries, such as um, air quality in general within the municipality, it's likely that that um, does not fall within the ambit of preemption uh, envisioned by the oil, gas, and solution mining law. Um, okay. Um, so putting it all together, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, municipalities uh, cannot completely eliminate or prevent oil and gas infrastructure through overly burdensome air restrictions. Most likely that would cons be considered to be preempted by federal law as an obstruction to a, um, a, a sort of a federal system for holistically regulating oil and gas activities. So it's a little bit different than the preemption we saw with the oil, gas, and solution mining law. However, what this there is opportunities for municipalities to pass uh, local air f ordinances that address relevant air quality issues, and this may extend to oil and gas facilities, although municipalities considering these ordinances should also consider more broadly air pollution in the locality, which likely they should be doing anyway. This is just an opportunity to pass those types of ordinances. And lastly, um, you know, we're preempted in the state in terms of regulating regulation of intrastate facilities. There's a different legal regime that applies to FERC regulated facilities, and um, you just have to be aware of that distinction. So that is all the time I have. Uh, thank you. That was awesome, and uh, I'm sure all of us need to hear that at least three times before we <laughs> get most of it. But the good news is um, Dan is not abandoning this question and this issue, so I am sure we will be able to learn more as he learns more and as time progresses, so stay tuned, I'm sure. Um, the next speaker uh, is, uh, is it Pramila or Pramila? Pramila. Pramila Malik, who is a community organizer. She founded uh, Stop the Mini Sink Compressor Station and Protect Orange County that both represent frontline communities impacted by gas infrastructure. And she's also uh, written about legal and regulatory framework of the gas industry. We are pleased to have you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So I want to thank you for inviting me and I, oh, how do I do this? That goes forward. Oh, great. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me and organizing this. Um, Minisync is a small rural residential community located in Orange County, about three hours southeast from here. Um, and three years ago, we embarked on what in many ways was a historic battle against fracking infrastructure. We, of course, lost that battle, but are here to share the lessons that we learned and also to talk about our ongoing experiences living with the facility. And I apologize, I'm gonna fly through this presentation because the time is limited. Um, when we started out, we were just simply a group of moms trying to sound the alarm about a dangerous facility that absolutely did not belong in a residential area. Of course, our primary concern was air quality. At the time, we did not realize how important this project would be to the gas industry and, um, and its relationship to fracking, and that we would soon become a small town fighting very big gas. 
We also did not realize that we were standing on the precipice of not only a climate change catastrophe, but also a public health catastrophe. So the first thing we did um, was follow the pipeline. The project sponsor was Millennium Pipeline. Um, thanks. The project sponsor was Millennium Pipeline. And this is a map of the pipeline. It goes right, uh, you could see it at the top is uh, Millennium. Uh, it goes right over the southern tier of New York. And where many think is the tiny green dot at the bottom right uh, of, the, um, of that pipeline. All the yellow dots are metering stations. All the green dots are compressor stations. And right below is a map of Pennsylvania. And you can see the top uh, northern um, uh, Pennsylvania filled with all of those um, unconventional wells. And what we found out was that Millennium was uniquely and strategically positioned to transport that frack gas to energy hungry markets, specifically New York City. And that is the big drive today. This industry needs markets and they need to transport that gas to those markets. Um, so when we started out, um, we you know, wrote our story that we were a, a community of families, farmers, and first responders fighting a very dangerous gas project that clearly didn't belong there. Um, why do we matter? Uh, we matter uh, because we are a microcosm of America. We were a middle class suburban community, um, even though it was in a rural area. We had a lot of 9-11 first responders, many with documented lung damage, and the fact that um, they uh, sacrificed us anyway um, tells you that they will go after any and every community um, that they need. When we started out, we engaged the, the process faithfully um, because we believed that the law and the facts were on our side, which they were. Um, we engaged the, the DEC process and the FERC process. At that time, we filed an unprecedented 600 public comments in opposition um, to uh, the, the project at FERC. Um, and when we lost at FERC, we also um, uh, took our case to the DC Circuit Court, the second highest court in the country. We also did something that we were advised to do was to look for an alternative, and we literally walked the pipeline to find that alternative. We found a remote site seven miles away, already owned by the company, a brownfield site that already had a compressor station on it, and um, that's the, the site at the right, but the company insisted that they had to be in many things surrounded by 200 families living within a half mile. So we did everything that's being suggested. We lobbied, litigated, protested, petitioned. Um, we marched in the streets of our little town. We took the entire town to the FERC hearing. Um, that's a picture of uh, some of the families sitting um, at the FERC hearing. Um, that's a picture of some of the kids signing it at Senator Schumer's office. After the FERC hearing, we went to the Senate office building and only to find corruption literally at every layer of government. Um, and the left is a chart that shows you um, donations by oil and gas companies in New York State. And of the top five donors, the, um, there are two that have a direct stake in this project. Um, the first is National Grid, the largest donor, and the fifth is CPV. <coughs> CPV is a uh, venture capital firm that had planned all along to build a power plant project seven miles north of us, which we discovered was the real purpose of that project. And then when we finally got our day at the DC Circuit Court, <clears throat> the ruling came down against us, and we found out that the judge who wrote the ruling um, had a direct uh, stake and interest um, in companies associated with that project, and they ignored all of our substantive arguments and basically said, um, you know what, we need the gas, and that's all that matters. So obviously, um, did I? Okay, right, so um, companies always come back for more. Um, these are some expansion plans uh, that the company has, um, more compression in many things. And um, the little green dot over there on the right is the power plant project. The red dot is Minisync. And you can see that there's an entire interconnecting pipeline network um, in the horizon that will take that gas up and around, um, down back to New York City and to Long Island, very close to Port Ambrose. Um, <coughs> what we discovered was that the laws don't apply to the gas industry. Um, that they're not worth the paper they're written on because there is neither the political will nor the resources to enforce them. Um, this is just a list of all the laws that were violated by this particular project. 
um, left us with a very deep sense of betrayal, the realization that the regulatory process is rigged, that corporate power has become excessive, um, that most of our fundamental rights really do not exist. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go on here. I'm going to talk about living with the facility. Um, these companies lie routinely. Um, it's standard operating procedure for them. So when they came into our town, they told us that um, nothing but water vapor would be emitted from the uh, two smokestacks. Um, and when they finally applied for their air permit, you can see that they sought permission to release over 60,000 tons of greenhouse gases, along with 100 tons of other toxins, known carcinogens, and neurotoxins, such as the volatile hydrocarbons and um, that interact with nitrous oxide to form ground level ozone, creating a tremendous health risk um, to the population. For those who don't know, compressor stations pressurize the gas to keep it moving along the pipeline, and they're generally required every 40 to um, 100 miles. Um, this is a list of um, chemicals uh, known to be associated with compressor stations, and I'm not going to go into that. I, I'm sure Nadia will, but um, I just want to show you that is much longer than the list on their permit. Okay. These are some of the symptoms associated with um, compressor stations and metering stations, by the way. Um, and we are already experiencing a bunch of them, uh, throat irritation, nosebleeds, rashes, nausea, headaches, um, muscle aches, abdominal cramps, very commonly reported. Um, these are the long-term um, impacts um, that worry us as parents. Um, I'm not going to go into them now. Um, this is a video that I want to show you really quickly. taken of the smokestacks uh, seen through a uh, flare camera. And as you watch this, I want you to remember the statement made by Millennium's president, that it would be nothing but water vapor. And also, as parents, we ask um, people, why is the burden of proof upon us to prove that we're being harmed? Why is the burden of proof not upon the industry to prove that they're safe? As it is with you know drugs when they're released into the market. So what do we live with? We live with odor events. Um, Alarms going off, uh, blowdown events, noise. This is just an example of one on September 7th. Um, there is no reporting, no accounting, no regulatory oversight. There is no agency, federal, state, or local, monitoring these companies. Um, this is a metering station, which is near us. We have two near us. Um, this is a child that was living near the near metering station, and this is a rash that he used to develop um, when he was home. Um, the family moved out. This is an odor event that occurred down the pipeline in Ramapo and in Mini Sink at the same time. Um, there was a child living near Ramapo. They had a rash. My daughter in Mini Sink at the same time had a nosebleed. Um, so why should we all care? We should all care because we're all interconnected. We're connected by the pipelines that poison us, um, the uh, food we all eat, the, the air we all breathe, the water we drink. And, um, you know, these interstate borders are absolutely irre irrelevant when it comes to um, toxic trespass through air and, and through water. I'm almost done. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by just uh, focusing on some of the lessons that we learned. Um, I'm not going to go into each of these for time, but I think the most important lesson we learned is that your local government is your first line of defense, and they are also the gateway to the industry. And then no matter what your project is, whether it's federal or state, engage every level of government. Um, the other thing we learned is that this is not your grandfather's gas. It's very different. That they always come back for more illegal segmentation is, is, is pretty standard as well. Um, follow the gas upstream, midstream, downstream. Make connections and connect the resistance. And that the root of our fracking problem is our broken democracy. And finally, the <laughs> The very last thing I want to say is that if you're not fighting the fracking market and the consumption of fracking and frack gas, you are not fighting fracking. And I say that because we just got word a few minutes ago that a power, the power plant project that we were fighting, um, they just uh, broke ground. Um, they started cutting down trees. Um, the um, the fire, local fire department has started, begun their hazmat training for, uh, for, for that project. 
and it's going to be a 650 megawatt gas-fired power plant allegedly slated to, to replace Indian Point, and you can't trade poisons and trade victims and call that an environmental victory. I'm sorry. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liz Haskins. Liz and her husband, who asked a question before, live within a half mile of a proposed 10,000 horsepower compressor station. It's being proposed as part of this uh, Dominion's new market project. Liz and her sister, Ruth Ann Stone, uh, co-chair the Madison County Neighbors for Environmental Preservation, a newly formed grassroots group that's fighting the compressor station proposed for Sheds, New York. And I also would like to thank, um, thank Alan and Sarah and everyone involved with this project. It's just been a tremendous learning experience for those of us here from, from Sheds um, who are brand new to this. I want to make sure I, what do I need to do? Okay, so my name is Liz. I am one of the co-chairs of the Madison County Neighbors for Environmental Preservation. I'm going to pull this off, yeah. but I'm trying not to use my time because I'm going to fly through this as well. So, um, uh, so I live in Madison County, New York, in a beautiful small rural uh, hamlet called Sheds, where Dominion Transmission is proposing a 10,880 horsepower natural gas station or natural. Comp I'm going to start all over a hand. Compressor station as part of their new market project. Dominion filed an abbreviated application with FERC on June 2nd, 2014, requesting expedited approval under an environmental assessment. Dominion already anticipates project approval March of 2015 and expects the full project to be in service on November of 2016. I was asked to speak today about MCNEP's part in Madison County's decision to take an active role in the FERC application process. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about where we were in April before Dominion came to town and, and the steps that we've taken to be where we are today. Less than two weeks after Dominion's open house on April 22nd of this year, we met with our neighbors and formed MCNEP. Most of us live within a half mile radius of the proposed site and have been forced into a crash course about natural gas production and infrastructure build out. I present today not as, not as an individual, but on behalf of this amazing uh, group of committed individuals. Prior to April, we saw each other maybe a few times a year at uh, graduation parties and currently we uh, are together seven times a month between our, our weekly meetings. We uh, attend two town board meetings and the county board supervisors meeting. Uh, and one of our, pr our priorities is to always have someone at one of those meetings. This has been a life changer for us. My husband called it sudden impact, and really that, that really describes it. Uh, as we began to educate ourselves, we discovered we really do have just cause for concern. We watched the Gasland video, the, um, the, the Gasland movie, the YouTube videos, words such as blowdowns, Halliburton loophole, gag orders, radon, volatile organic compounds, and nitrous oxides became part of our daily vocabulary. We learned about noise and vibration concerns, uh, accidents, loss in property values experienced by people living near compressor stations. It was early in May when we came upon Minisync's website, and we visited Pramila Malik, and uh, we credit her really for where we are today. Uh, the insight and direction she provided to us was of great help as we began our work refuting Dominion's claim that the benefit of this project outweighed any adverse impacts experienced by affected landowners and communities. Pramila shared strategies uh, to consider when challenging applications in the FERC process. So as I reflected back on the past seven months and the uh, strategies of MCNEP, I really could group them into these three, these three areas, education, public awareness, action, and perseverance. First, we had to educate ourselves. We didn't know what a compressor station was. Uh, we had no idea, so we continually researched, and this is, this is something that doesn't let up. We have to know what we're talking about, and um, we have to study. So we do pull up YouTube videos of, um, of FERC meetings. We study other project dockets to see, you know, what are people saying and how is, 
how is FERC um, coming back and responding to those comments? Public education and awareness was more of a challenge because gas companies are only required to inform landowners within a half mile radius of the project. So the public at large has little or no knowledge of what's happening. And with the exception of a legal notice that was placed in our local paper by Dominion, it was McNapp who did all of, the, uh, all of the ads. We ran informational ads linking people to websites, telling them about accidents, blowdowns, um, reported health risks. We ran two uh, inserts in our local papers uh, for informational sessions that we put together. Three different advertisements of the FERC meeting. The local authorities or the local officials gave a one day notice for that, that October 8th uh, meeting in Georgetown. We used flyers, posters, and social media. We contacted Dr. Wilma Subra, and with her permission, uh, distributed copies of the preservation about the health, ri health risks that she gave in Minisync, um, and we, we gave that to everyone who would take it, anyone who would talk with us. We contacted and met with elected officials and community leaders. We attended all and speak at most of the town and county board meetings. We submit our comments to the clerk so they can be made part of the record. We also provide copies of our research to be made part of the official record, because that way no one can say, we didn't know. Uh, we, we, uh, we are all interveners. Um, we comment on a number of issues, but the one thing we consistently comment on is the health concerns. We respectfully ask our representatives to, to fulfill their responsibility to protect the people they represent and to carry our message regardless of their personal views. Actions are another constant activity of the group. So in respect of time, I'm only going to mention a few. Uh, collectively, we visited six different compressor stations. So we could give firsthand testimony of what we saw, what we heard, and what we smelled. Um, we had both, uh, we had a booth at the local fair where we distributed many handouts. We enlarged a map that we had obtained from the county planning department. And we, we had asked them to put radius uh, circles. So we had 0.5 all the way up to five miles. So when folks came in and visited our booth, they could actually take a push pin and put where their house was and see, geez, I'm, in with, I'm within that uh, radius. I'm, with, I'm, I'm going to be affected by this. We provided lawn uh, signs to supporters of MCNEP. Um, one member walked two parades. She literally followed the parade, handing out information and handing out flyers about, about um, the project. Uh, we put on two informational meetings. We organized in August with credible and knowledgeable, knowledgeable speakers, Mary Menapace, Larissa Dierska, Nadia Steinzer, Bill Houston, and Scott Clark, many of which are here today. We retained legal counsel. With only 20 members of our core group, the funds we raised are only a small fraction of what we will need should we need to take this to or take legal action. So we do a lot of the work on our own. We foil our own documents, and we try to use him sparingly. <laughs> Um, perseverance, never give up. Uh, in spite of the many people who from day one said to us, you won't win, you're, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your energy, we reply that we have no choice, we're fighting for our lives. So lessons learned, uh, base comments on factual data. In our experience, our elected officials validate only peer-reviewed data submitted by professionals. Testimony given by people who experienced this firsthand, uh, the list of 6,000 harm that we gave to them, uh, they, they were considered to be biased and they dismissed those. They just won't even, won't even look at them. We had to change our verbiage. Uh, our verbiage. Um, there are many gas leases in the township of DeRider and Georgetown. So when we began to talk about this, fracking is, is uh, viewed as an opportunity for many of these folks. So though we know that it's fracked gas that will be moving through this proposed station, we found that uh, people were more receptive, receptive if we didn't use that word. So we had to be, uh, we had to be um, creative on how we would talk about things. So, and, and also our attorney instructed us to, or advised us to do the same thing. So we don't say frack anymore. We usually will say, you know, unconventional dr gas drilling or something that uh, we don't use the F word because they're a little more receptive. <laughs> Um, responses from the public included the government, they wouldn't allow anything uh, to come in that would be harmful. They, they wouldn't allow that. Um, the, the emissions are regulated. You have nothing to worry about, you know. Again, uh, with the factual data, we were able to take that EPA booklet and say, no, right here it says they're, they're exempt, but I may need to talk to Dan if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, it leaves little room for argument. When you can back that up with something that's solid, that's coming from the government, it's, it's harder for people to argue that. 
Um, so it was really the Madison County Department of Health who acted on our requests for help. When my husband spoke to Eric Feist, the director of the uh, health department in early May, uh, he responded that this was really not their area of expertise. Um, you know, they focus more on flus and, and uh, vaccines and things of that nature. And you have to understand at this point, uh, most of our group were not sleeping. Uh, we were very distraught and um, we were overwhelmed. And Jim simply said to him, Eric, don't you care about the people in Madison County? And uh, we credit Eric Feist, the director of the Madison County Health Department, for hearing our concerns and stepping up to encourage the Board of Supervisors to move forward with a health study to evaluate Dominion's application, health studies, or health risks, and ensure baseline testing was conducted. The Board unanimously approved a resolution to contract with Thimble Creek Research to meet the previously mentioned goals. Eric created and led a work group that included a member um, of McNep and a number of other individuals that worked with Thimble Creek, I'm trying to fly here, <laughs> to incorporate community concerns and comments in the final report. Um, it was submitted, the final report, I'm sorry, I skipped a little bit. The final report that was um, put together, 43 pages, uh, does validate the concerns that we all have. It talks about that there are health risks, there are data gaps, and um, we need an environmental impact statement. And EA is not enough for this project. So this was submitted on October 15th. We do have copies of this report out on our table. Um, so next steps are, are that uh, baseline studies need to be done. Should this be approved, Thimble Creek will then go forward with baseline studies. And um, for next steps for MCNEP, we are now using that 43-page report to respectfully request a moratorium. It's time to stop. So um, Maura mentioned earlier that this is, uh, it is the locals who are fighting with the help of others coming in. We're desperately in need of your help. Um, I think that papers are being, were they passed out, Keith and Ruthann already? Um, we desperately need help. On, on November 20th, FERC needs to hear a united message. Stop, stop, <laughs> how appropriate, stop. Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> Comments on the new market project um, are needed. So information, uh, we're out there. Please come see us. Uh, it's affecting many of us, and thank you again. I'm sure a lot of us will like to uh, see that report. Liz, no reason we can't post that 43-page uh, final report on our website. It's on Facebook. So we'll get it up on our website. We'll start populating things. Okay. Um, in case I forget, I'm also going to suggest a lot of people wanted to announce a lot of really good stuff, and I had to say I'm sorry, we just can't. I'm suggesting people write on the board uh, if there's a website they want people to go to or a resource or an organization, put it up there. Um, and I'm going to put up there, I don't know if you know, physicians, scientists, and engineers for healthy energy have a database that is up to date, and it's all the peer-reviewed articles. So when Liz was saying they only want to pay attention to peer review, we know that's ridiculous, but if that's what they're doing, at least there's a place and it's a searchable database. Our next speaker, uh, Nadia Steinzor, is the Eastern Program Coordinator of the Oil and Gas Accountability Project at Earthworks. And that's a national organization I'm sure we've all heard of, dedicated to protecting communities and the environment from the impacts of mining and energy development. Most recently, Nadia was involved in developing and managing research projects on health impacts of shale gas development in Pennsylvania and the inability of state regulators to oversee operations. And we invited her here to particularly talk about monitoring. Here she is. Timekeeper. Yes, it is. All right, my friendly timekeeper. And this is her. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. Thanks to all the organizers for including me in this. And I'm really pleased and honored to follow on, on everyone who went before me today. Um, and a particular shout out to Pramila and Liz for the incredible work they're doing. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about monitoring and air testing and why it matters. And the title of my presentation kind of says the first reason why it matters, because people have a right to know what's in their air for all the reasons we've been discussing. And I'm just going to give a few uh, 
quick overview of the context into which testing and monitoring projects by all of us and by nonprofit organizations have become necessary. Um, first of all, is the obvious, there's a huge timing mismatch. This boom got off before we could figure out what to do about it and before the impacts were considered. Um, there is a crisis in oversight and enforcement. Um, there is no regulatory agency in the nation that has a handle on this industry, and as the boom um, continues, they are um, falling further and further behind in their rates of inspection and so on. Then the loopholes for polluters. I won't go into all the details. Somebody mentioned the Halliburton loophole, but there are actually seven um, federal laws which all contain um, significant loopholes that make the tracking of actual pollution and and by um, association, the uh, actual understanding of their impacts very difficult. And in, for the purposes we're talking about today and in this session, um, there is a big loophole in the Clean Air Act um, which allows operators to permit many small facilities that may be for one project. Segmentation was referred to. This is somewhat related. Um, there has also just been really limited research on the health impacts of oil and gas development historically. That may seem incredible now that we have almost a million oil and gas wells in the United States, but it is true. And there is a lot that has em is emerging in the last several years, and monitoring is part of that. Um, we're still struggling to draw a connection between a particular facility and a particular health impact, um, but that's where testing comes in. And then state and federal li monitoring um, is limited to urban areas, high population areas, and generally public water supplies, which are not really always the situations um, in the gas fields. And then we've had really limited baseline water and air testing um, by agencies to even get us started to know what was there before drilling came to town. So the primary reason that testing matters is because the gas industry continues to insist that gas development, all the infrastructure, just like drilling, is a clean um, process or vapor only, as we heard, um, <clears throat> and that you know the water contamination will never, the chemicals will never reach the water table, et cetera. So testing matters to refute that. That's the long-term goal, to build a body of data that we all can use to counter that argument. Um, but most importantly, it gives residents the information they need and deserve to know what's in their air and what might be affecting them, especially if they start to have health impacts. So it's an empowering kind of activity, um, and it fills all these information gaps in the, that I mentioned earlier, you know, in the previous slide, all the things that we don't have, and testing is a big part of filling those gaps. And then it responds to the show me the evidence, or as Liz said, show me the peer-reviewed research um, about, you know, tell, show me evidence that it's a problem. The fact that your kid has a nosebleed since it started isn't enough for me. We can debate that at a break. Um, so it challenges assumptions, and over time, the hope of all of us doing testing and monitoring work is that it will change the debate and change our energy choices. So that's the long-term thing. I'm not going to go into all of these. This is just a sampling of all the monitoring and testing work that's been done um, in the last several years. Um, the Warning Signs is a new report out by the Global uh, Community Monitor and the Coming Clean Network, which actually it's a very unique approach, put the actual tools, the methods, in the hands of the citizens they were, they were um, following. Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project um, has also been key, and they're starting to work in New York as well. Um, to find uh, ways to combine health symptoms information with air monitoring data. Um, and the other studies, I put the uh, Utah Department of Environmental Quality up there um, because that's a huge monitoring project. It's not citizens-based, but it's really showing the connection between um, VOCs and ozone and oil and gas production. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our work. Um, in 2011 to 12, we um, set out to see if there were, uh, if we could identify patterns and associations between the health symptoms that people across Pennsylvania were reporting and the air around them. Um, and it involved gas wells, compressor stations, and waste impoundment um, facilities. And then in 2013, um, we started a project to follow up on some of those cases and to do more in-depth testing and monitoring around um, those homes. 
and developed case studies, which are um, all on our website. And all in all, we ended up with data from over 100 health symptom surveys and um, about 90 uh, air and water tests altogether. And we really wanted to see if we could see associations between what was going on and what people were experiencing. So I'll have to fly through this. But remarkably, even to our surprise, we found that the top symptoms, and this is now showing to be consistent with other studies that have come out, were similar in all the counties. We tested and spoke with people all across Pennsylvania in many counties. And most reported odors and said that the symptoms were either new or had gotten worse since the activity started. Um, we saw higher rates of certain symptoms in people who were um, closer by. Thanks. Um, and then we also found that health symptoms at households closely matched the known health impacts of the chemicals that we detected at those households. I think, I hope I said that to make sense. So that there was a 68% match between, you know, benzene, for example, was detected at a certain home where everyone was in the home was reporting headaches, which is a very known um, symptom of benzene, and the list goes on. So we also found in the blackout report that we did, which actually ended up being because of what we were finding as we went along, we thought we could find all this information on what was happening at these sites, and it was so difficult to get the information that it became a report really about how citizens are being kept out of the loop of what's going on around them in the state of Pennsylvania. But we, add, we did look at emissions data that the state of Pennsylvania keeps. New York, D.C. also has an emissions base, database for industrial facilities, and many compressor stations are on there, existing compressor stations. So we found that some of the compressor stations where the, case, the people we were following over the years had the worst health symptoms were among the top polluters in their counties. So they exceeded industrial facilities, they exceeded power plants, single compressor stations. Large ones, but single ones. So now the question is, with all of these different studies coming out, and all of, a lot of them are pointing in a similar direction. You know, our work is among many that are out there. Um, and as others have said, there's a lot of peer-reviewed research coming out, thank goodness, because that seems to be the high bar. Um, and I'll just name a few examples of how this testing is being applied um, to regulatory and policy change and also influencing the minds of decision makers. So in 2011, um, a group out of the University of Pittsburgh went and tested water at the, in the Monongahela River upstream from a wastewater treatment plant that was accepting frack water and downstream. And the differences in their tests led to an investigation by the state and eventually a couple of lawsuits. It also led to a bottled water advisory for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, but there have been, there's a lot that's happened as a result of that, that that, that process got started. Um, Colorado recently became the first state in the nation to pass uh, methane emissions rules, and those actually came about, um, it requires operators, I forget the end date, they have several years to do it, but requires them to reduce their emissions by 95%. We'll see if they can get there. But um, because with methane comes a lot of other uh, VOCs and, and other chemicals. But that came about because the, the operators were reporting certain levels of emissions. And everybody was saying, huh, that seems awfully low. So researchers from the University of Colorado went out and flew around um, with special equipment and found that there was a huge gap and that there was a lot more coming out of those facilities than the operators were saying. And that became a major part of the debate in the state level in Colorado around these rules. Um, on the more local level, which is extremely important, there's a coalition in Pennsylvania right now called Protect Our Children. Um, several towns are getting involved. People are organizing to try to prevent compressor stations and new large well pads from going in very close to schools. And they're doing amazing organizing work with school nurses and health officials and so on. And they are using testing data from our work and a lot of other studies, actual you know, um, evidence from various methodologies, and I don't have time to go into all the methods, but there's so many different ones that you can use, um, to provide testimony and talk to their officials. And it seems to be having an effect. Okay. Um, and then, as has been mentioned before by other people, residents can take all this information, this growing body of data, the peer-reviewed science, the information from what communities are directly experiencing, 
um, to their officials to appeal permits, file complaints, demand investigations. It's sort of like the legal term, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, if you can cast some doubt that the, like the case in Colorado, that the operator, what the reporting is accurate, sometimes you need the help of Cracker Jack attorneys like Dan to help you figure out how to appeal a permit. Um, but in other cases, just getting up there and having this testament, I think Liz's um, talk illustrates that, to show that you, know, you need to do your job and figure this out. And all of that testing data as we grow a body of information is really critical to do that. So I'm particularly excited to be here because one of the things our, my organization and so many others want to do going forward is figure out how to bring this information to bear in New York, how to do more baseline testing in the communities where compressors are coming in, et cetera. And we really need to get up to speed, as Bill and others have been describing, who regulates what, who do we appeal to, who do we protest to, and um, so we do need to do more testing, um, but I would argue too, I think, I think we're on safe ground to say that this incredibly growing body of evidence in the last several years on these issues also is enough to invoke the precautionary principle. And my favorite double negative is that a lack of information is not an excuse for inaction. And so that's why we need to get continually innovative and continually active in applying the data and the information that we have and not listen when regulators and policymakers say, oh, there's no evidence, because the evidence is growing and it's pointing in very similar directions. Um, the other problem is that agencies really need to be pushed, and I think we have to figure out how to do this um, legally and as in our communities to consider the additive effect of putting more in. There are many communities downstate, for example, that are already in um, violating federal air pollution standards, and why are we adding more compressor stations? So really push them to look at what's called the accumulative effects. There is no regulatory agency that currently does that. FERC is legally obligated to. There's probably room for maneuver in there. And it would be great to get some air and water baseline testing. Some states do require it. New York does not. Um, it's all very disjointed, but um, that's a role that communities can play is establishing some of this baseline testing. If you already do, if you currently do not have um, industrial facilities, and I know there are folks here from the Han who are dealing with a Hancock compressor in the Western Catskills. And that is shaping up to be a really important test because they did get pre-compressor pre activity um, information. And now they're, they're continuing the testing. Um, there's, pro there's a lot of room for maneuver in terms of um, forcing the, the operators to continually upgrade their um, technologies and have the strongest emissions controls. And I'll just um, finish by saying underscoring what Pramila and others have said about shifting the burden of proof. All this testing work and getting involved as communities is essential and it's interesting and important, but it's also the job of regulators and policymakers. <laughs> and so at some point, um, I think you know, part of our job is to make them do theirs. And that's a lot of what, what drives this work. And then the last thing, it's not the last bullet there, flip them around, that um, you know, all of these permits allow a certain level of pollution, and that's incredibly frustrating and shocking to say, oh, they can emit 60,000 tons, but they can't emit 100,000 tons, you know, and you go around and around. Um, but the permit to, the, to pollute does not mean the freedom to harm, and I think it's that, the space between those two that we can find convincing arguments and bring this body of, growing body of data to bear as so, as so many of you are doing in your communities. So thank you. One of the things that uh, had came together recently, which I found quite exciting, was um, citizen monitoring, as Nadia was mentioning. Uh, around the United States, citizens were trained on how to take samples in ways that were compatible with uh, protocols that made them uh, legally uh, uh, admissible. And uh, a peer-reviewed article recently came out that highlighted those data. So it's trying to bring together, uh, yes, it's peer-reviewed, and yes, it's citizen-generated. 
we're going to have a, a two-minute talk by Susie Winkler, who lives in Burlington, New York, in Otsego County. And she's been working against shale gas infrastructure, fighting the Constitution pipeline, and more recently, the New Market Project proposal. Hey there. Um, as the infrastructure balloons across as the infrastructure balloons across the state, um, we're being approached by industry. Towns and their planning boards are getting letters from pipeline companies. The companies are simultaneously trying to get information from town boards and planning boards about specifics about the landscape, whether it's uh, historic areas or wetlands or endangered species, that kind of stuff. But they're also simultaneously trying to judge the temperature of the community and the town board to find out how receptive they are to the ideas and if they're willing to comply with the industry. So um, towns that supply the information are helping to push, protect, help to push these um, industries forward. And so we have to stop that. Uh, the letters sound official when they arrive and town boards and planning boards are kind of put off and afraid by that. Um, and that's exactly the intention of the letters. Um, but they're not requests from the federal government and we need to remind our town boards about that. Uh, the letters, no. Likewise, um, town boards are also being wined and dined by the industry um, behind closed doors, um, sometimes in public. But um, <laughs> they are being given false information and they're being told that the projects are insignificant and won't harm their citizens. And then unfortunately those supervisors are going back out into the community and telling that to the people who have received, the, the directly affected people who are living around those projects are being told not to worry. And that's the problem, that then the citizens don't get out and get involved. So um, communities that put out an unwelcome atmosphere are being viewed as problematic, and if you're problematic, there's a good chance, not a good chance, but there's some chance that the industry will walk away from your town and go look for an easier mark. So um, that's, that, that's something we can think towards. Coming at this from another direction, we also know that there are towns, as other people have said, that are passing resolutions opposing pipelines. It's not that complicated. It seems like it's a big deal. But uh, in my county, we just got five towns to put proposals together in a week's time to, ar to argue a project. So um, that's something we should actually get out, sample resolutions. Um, and I can say that each of the five towns altered it for what they felt was appropriate for their particular community and their, you know, the board. But they were all still five resolutions, still very good. Um, lastly, the idea here is to get out to your planning board as soon as you find out that there is something coming to your community, maybe before, and tell them that they should be non-responsive when it comes to the industry. They are not required to respond to their letters. Okay, at this point we have uh, a moderately short time for questions and for comments. So, Joe, are you standing to give one? One of each. Oh. <laughs> Pick your one. <laughs> okay, well, we need these now. Please pass them my way, not to me literally, but down the aisle to this side. My question is, what is the experience of folks what do they use FOIL requests for at the local level, and is it worth doing? Okay, that's a pretty broad question, and I don't know whether there's somebody here. Is Bob Niad still here? No, yep. Liz, you wanna give an answer? Liz, come up and give an answer. 
We foiled early on. We foiled our town government. Uh, we also foiled uh, DEC. And what we did find as we go through the 800 and some odd page application is there are some, um, there are some differences. So I would recommend foiling just to go through and, and see what's, what's happened. And you can find those differences because then you can use them in your uh, responses to FERC as you're fighting a project. That was differences between what, Liz? And to, uh, Ruth Ann. I'm going to call on Ruth Ann there. What, it was the uh, different emission levels. Is that? Yeah, so it was okay, a so in I'll repeat that for the for the camera. That what was uh, different was the permittee, uh, the person looking for the permit dominion, what they said to FERC and what they said to DEC were not the same in terms of air emissions. How about another question? Uh, yes, this is uh, for uh, Nadia Steinzer. Um, very, very interesting um, a presentation on data collection. Uh, I'm just interested in how citizens uh, get these kits. And uh, what keeps, uh, uh, obviously, most citizens would, would be um, uh, non-professionals. What keeps the, the data from being challenged uh, by the industry? Well, I wish I could say that the data was not challenged by <laughs> industry. Um, but I think many of us who are doing this work have gotten to the point of just accepting that no matter what you do, you're going to get challenged. Duke University got challenged when they did their first studies on water. So I'll just put that out there. Um, it's a difficult question. I think every community needs to balance the money they have with the methodologies available. And there are uh, projects out there to help do training. We did. We worked primarily with SUMA canisters. They look like little spaceships. You leave them out for 12 to 24 hours. Those are. We trained a couple of the homeowners um, because it's also really just hard to get to certain locations on a regular basis. So there, you can certainly train people to do it and. Um, the work that Coming Clean did used something called buckets with a uh, Tevlar bag. It's like a plastic bucket. Those are great because you can get out there as soon as there's a blowdown or some problem. And they're also much less expensive, though they may not test for certain things. So there's a whole suite. If you're interested in it, I would recommend you um, contact the uh, Coming Clean Network, which is a consortium of groups trying to help communities to do more testing. Um, and I'm also happy to give you some information at the break. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't think we're going to keep doing this community testing work in the short term, but we are um, continuing to assist folks in getting the resources they need to do it. Thank you. And I know for the data that were collected for the article I mentioned, there was uh, substantial training of the people in how to collect samples and chain of custody. So it was not, it was not so simple. Uh, next. Lindsay? Oh. This question is for Dan, actually. Okay. Um, with with asking the local governments to come in and stand up with Air um, uh, Clean Air Act, if there's already an existing compressor station in the county, um, where do you go from there? Because there, you know what I'm saying. Uh, so it's it. So again, we're, I, I'll just reiterate that we're sort of in the nascent stages of research into looking into how ordinances of general applicability, applicability would apply to um, infrastructure facilities within the town. However, with, with respect to PSC regulated facilities, so intrastate facilities, there likely would not be much room to have um, perspective effect to that facility unless there was uh, a renewal of the certificate they would have to somehow get another certificate and then at that point they would maybe have to take into account local law with interstate facility there may be more room to maneuver so FERC regulated facilities there may be more room to maneuver but again that depends on how a court would interpret the particular, that savings clause within the Natural Gas Act. And one thing that I didn't, because I was sort of just flying through the presentation, I didn't have a chance to sort of tie in some of the larger ideas. That's an ambiguous area of the law. Um, I think there's a very strong argument that the act was not intended to preempt uh, local air ordinances of general applicability. However, that's up to, that'll be up to a court to decide. I don't think any court has directly addressed the issue. Um, as I noted, the Dominion transmission case, I think that's the Fourth Circuit, 
sort of address the issue, but not directly. One thing we do know, and this is from the Dominion Transmission case, if that local ordinance is a part of the state implementation plan, the state's uh, program that it gets certified by EPA, then that was held not to be preempted in that case in the Fourth Circuit. So that's, that's another potential angle to look at incorporating local ordinances into state implementation plans. You mean intrastate? Uh, get you know what? It's you know what, Peter? You're out of line. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lindsay. Well, they 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 do, but it's just a it's a, just a question of who has regulatory authority. So at some point, the Natural Gas Act draws a line, and if you're on the other side of the line, you're PSC, and then there's another line for unregulated facilities. If you're not, if you're below a thousand feet and under uh, 125 pounds per square inch. Okay, Lindsay. All right, so this is another question for Dan. Um, when I was doing the research to help uh, Bill put together his presentations, I came across this little fact about the um, 2012 Clean Air Act amendments, which talked about how the regulations of the uh, natural gas industry under those uh, only applied to the actual production piece and not further downstream, like compressor stations, things like that. And I think I've just got conference brain at this point, but I'm trying to figure out where, if that would, if the Clean Air Act not having anything to say about further downstream would give municipalities more authority or less? And I'm trying to figure that out. So, so, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not a Clean Air Act expert and I don't uh, completely know those amendments. Was that amendments or regulations? I think it was. Uh, maybe regulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, and I'm not, uh, the rules, right. So I'm not super familiar with their applicability, but the federal government has the ability to address um, different aspects of, uh, you know, extraction, production, uh, transmission through the Clean Air Act Authority. So those rules um, apply to extraction. Transmission is generally uh, governed by FERC, but again, there's that exception for Clean Air Act Authority. It doesn't interfere with the state's, with the state authority as exempted by, as, as sort of that, that authority cut out under the Natural Gas Act to, to incorporate those facilities in their state implementation plan. Or to the extent that um, local authority is also preserved, that, that local, local governments would have the ability to regulate transmission. So just because the EPA is taking action in one part of the stream doesn't necessarily mean that that forecloses other actors like the state or localities to take action with respect to air pollution at other parts of the stream. So we have a very short time left in this and I can see a lot of people wanting to ask questions and I'm sure they're really important and I don't know what we're going to do about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Sandra Swanson from Stafford, New York, Genesee County, uh, 30 miles west of Rochester, New York. Our town has uh, had a moratorium or a second moratorium for a year and a half. And um, we have uh, the, the uh, lawyer, you all know him, uh, working on a, a law for uh, banning fracking in our town. And the uh, fracking law has just been put off and put off and put off until finally, last month, we've been asking every month, what is the status, what is the status, what is the status? Finally, last month, uh, we decided to foil the any and all information having to do with the uh, gas law that's being uh, provided to us uh, free of charge by uh, uh, the lawyer that you know. And... Uh, so uh, the the. Uh, He's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I have to remember my story. So I'm going to go as quickly as possible. Yeah, but we're, get, we're getting low, the guy, short on time. The guy is um, not going to tell us that he doesn't want to have fracking, and he's going to get it around anyway. And uh, so 
we did FOIL and get the information, and we realized that the law had been in their hands uh, since June. And, but this is just last week, so we hadn't gotten any information until last week. Also, at the same time, the lawyer and the, the at the same time, the lawyer and the supervisor have uh, presented to the town lawyer. Where are we going Thank with you. this? Where we're are we going, going with we're this? We're going to someplace really important, and I'm slow. Let's go. So, so, um, so the right, uh, the supervisor introduced the right, uh, a right to farm law. Does everybody here know what a right to farm law yes. is? Yes. Okay. There are three waves of right to farm, and so this is the latest, and this latest is changing the nomenclature of what actually uh, agriculture is, and it's going to change it to include energy production or energy harvesting. And in our town, the supervisor must really know that because he was going to put in the right to farm law, which has this uh, nomenclature in it, and uh, preempt this law that we're going to have through um, this one lawyer that I've been talking about. So what I want to tell you is, please research the right to farm laws uh, all over the nation, especially Missouri. Find out what they're really doing. And also, I'd like to tell you about uh, a new consortium at Penn State University called Ag Law Food Consortium. And it's run by a guy named Ross P-I-F-E-R, Pfeiffer, who, right on their mission statement, says uh, that they are including energy production in all of agriculture from now on. They're trying to get it through. So That sounds worth looking into. OK. Interesting. OK. Uh, very quick question. It, this may be for Dan. Um, actually, hold on one second. So we are actually at 3 o'clock. I think we're all keenly interested. And I would say that we also sort of need a break. So I don't know where to go with that. We're going to have a waste session that is going to start promptly at 325 in 25 minutes. And perhaps what I would like to do is say, those of you who need to get up, need to go get a break, get a cookie, get some coffee, go pee, whatever it is you need to do, just take a break from Conference Brain, feel free. That's what's scheduled right now. And I would recommend that that's something a lot of us need to do. There are the yellow sheets out there if you want to sign up for something. And if our speakers are willing, are you willing? Then what I would also suggest is that those who um, can are interested in sticking around and having some questions and having some answers and making some comments, that that's OK, too. So let's wait a minute and let people get up and get out. And frankly, at one point, I'm going to get up and get out. I think everybody <laughs> Use the facilities. Yeah. Well, I think. Just let them go. <laughs> <laughs>